After close to two decades of municipal politics, including eight years as mayor, Tom Logren has decided the time has come to move on to other opportunities and will be leaving his office at City Hall following the municipal election of October 27th. He joins Speaking of Timmins today as our first ever guest to discuss his career in politics and reminisce about the many successes and challenges that he has endured as one of the more popular councillors and mayors in the history of Timmins. I'm Frank Rock, and welcome to Speaking of Timmins. Welcome everyone to part two of our interview with Mayor Tom Logan, where we touch on a number of key issues that are currently at the forefront in the city of Timmins. Mayor Tom, Timmins, like many other communities, are having to deal with the fact that their infrastructure is not getting any younger. Uh, what do you think the city of Timmins and the province need to do in order to properly address this growing problem, which will be impacting the city and the taxpayers over the next decade and beyond? Well, the infrastructure deficit in Timmins is no different than what it is anywhere else in Canada, and uh, you know you have, we have to continue to fight both the provincial and federal governments to uh, be able to get our fair share. Um, I, you know, I think having said that, we've also uh, gone through probably six of uh, the eight years I was in office with probably one of the uh, worst economic crises since the Great Depression. So obviously, uh, you know, even though there was government money put into uh, different programs and infrastructure projects, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, I, I personally believe that the funding mechanism that exists now as far as taxation is broken and needs to be changed. And I think when you look at uh, for every dollar of taxes, uh, you know, uh, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario break it down to uh, 47 cents for the feds, 44 cents for the province, and 9 cents for the municipalities. Uh, when you think about the services that are provided by a municipality, and they're ones that uh, you know people rely on and depend on and see every day, uh, that formula has to change. So for me, there needs to be a much greater emphasis on partnerships as it relates to infrastructure, and I think those partnerships have to be uh, set up in a method that also deals with um, you know, your construction season, because ours is short. Uh, I think you have to uh, put it on to uh, population, because the smaller communities can't afford the one-third, 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 where maybe some of the larger ones, and I'm talking bigger than Timmins, can. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that whole gamut has to be looked at. And uh, if not, um, you know, uh, partnerships may have to extend out as much as uh, even looking at industry uh, in some shape or form. To, uh, to be able to help with infrastructure and, uh, you know, when you're looking at developing parts of your community, putting a bigger and bigger load on, on those developers to uh, provide services and warranty and, you know, I mean, even in the construction business, you know, uh, is the asphalt we're putting down, uh, you know, the best that it can be? Uh, I think all those things need to be looked at uh, in the big picture. Infrastructure being a great lead-in to, uh, to this next question, uh, considering that all the problems that have occurred uh, on Algonquin Boulevard this year, and considering the fact that Algonquin is essentially a provincial highway with heavy truck traffic on a daily basis, uh, should the province be uh, more involved in offsetting the cost of repairs and maintenance for Algonquin Boulevard? Well, let's face it, uh, when we're talking Algonquin Boulevard, in my mind, we're talk talking really from the tracks in Porcupine uh, that are buried by asphalt now to the turnoff at Camas Scotia, mm -hmm. the 20-kilometer stretch. And to me, that's provincial highway. It's provincial highway that runs through our community. Uh, formerly, we had a, a 90-10 agreement with the province that for every dollar that was spent from a capital perspective, and, and you have to remember that this needed to be approved, but day the province would pay the 90 and we the city would pay the 10 and on the maintenance side uh, you know we would pay our 50 cents and they would pay their 50 cents so today you know we pay the dollar uh, uh, for dollar on the maintenance side and on the capital side there's no money and uh, I think it's a travesty that any government of any stripe uh, would have looked at, uh, at doing that to you know to Timmins and many other municipalities I have to tell you I was in a meeting uh, last, uh, I'm going to say it was about a year or so ago, may maybe as as late as February, I should say, probably at o Ontario Good Roads, and Minister Murray was the minister, and he convened a, a meeting of municipalities that formally had that type of agreement. And I had to tell you, I near fell down when I went into the room and saw ha how many municipalities it was with a, a various degree of issues, um, but how a province could do that to... Uh, partners or supposed partners in municipalities 
um, I could never understand. And again, it's something that uh, both the provincial and federal government, in my mind, have a hand in, and it's something definitely that we fought hard and, and uh, probably didn't get where we wanted to get uh, as it relates to it, but I think the seed has been planted, and I, I believe it'll be up to the next mayor and council to, uh, to make sure that that seed grows and that money does come to uh, a community like Timmins. Another issue that gets a lot of attention on a fairly regular basis are the arenas in the community. Do you believe that it is feasible for the city to maintain its current approach of making minor upgrades and simply maintaining and repairing our existing arenas? Or do you believe that it's time for the city to seriously look at the possibility of constructing a new multi-purpose sports facility for uh, for the community? Well, I think, uh, you know, very similar to, uh, to roads or water or sewer infrastructure, uh, you know, your recreation facilities are aging and, uh, you know, uh, I don't care which the community is, we probably have never, uh, there's probably no community that ever puts enough money into them, and as they age, those issues get bigger. So I guess it's twofold. One is, um, you know, in, in some of the areas that we have spent money, I think it's money well spent. I think when you look at uh, a historic building like the McIntyre as an example, um, you know, I still believe that your marquee facility and uh, needs to be kept up, and, and obviously if we build one that is... Uh, it becomes that marquee facility, uh, you know, I think from a history perspective, uh, you know, the McIntyre Arena will be something that, uh, you know, people will, will want to see in the community and, uh, you know, have a purpose in the community. Uh, I think when you look at some of the uh, the smaller arenas, uh, you know, uh, you know, can we continue to, to pour money into them uh, at the rate they may need? Uh, again, that's a decision for our future council. Um, but I mean, I think again, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we went into the uh, the master rec tourism culture plan was to be able to have a plan going forward that will f- probably look at, out at the next 10 to 20 years. And I suspect in that time frame, as long as there's a good financial plan, um, you know, there will be uh, you know new facilities built. But I think you also have to look at uh, the debt load that the uh, you know the city will have as it relates to uh, water and sewer when you look at the amount of money that has been uh, put into that over the past uh, 10 years. I think when we, you know, we just asked the question about Algonquin and infrastructure, so I think, you know, depending on what happens with that, and the city doesn't have any huge reserves of money that can uh, put their share up ASAP, so again, those are areas you're going to have to look at at borrowing and uh, what kind of impact that puts on future budgets, I think will also uh, trigger what happens, uh, you know, on the uh, on the recreation side, and I think the other uh, area that was really looked at in the uh, rec portion of the master plan, and, and probably uh, indirectly to the tourism as well, is, uh, you know, there's there's other amenities in our community such as ski hills, golf clubs, cross country clubs, uh, you know, bike clubs, etc., mm-hmm. that all struggle, and um, you know, um, what are we going to do for them as well to ensure that they stay running because again they have a huge part of uh, attracting people to your community uh, keeping people especially professional people within your community so I think the whole bailiwick uh, has to be looked at and uh, I think we've all watched uh, uh, I think we've been very fortunate in our community that uh, ladies uh, hockey and girls hockey has taken off to the extent it has because I think um, some of the usage that would have been lost because of the downturn in hockey in general uh, across all of Canada, uh, but I mean, again, usage um, versus what you're going to build build will have to be looked at as well. The uh, the Ring of Fire is another project that has received a lot of publicity over the past couple of years, and it still remains unclear what type of role, if any, attendance might play in its development. Can you provide our viewers with an update on uh, the Ring of Fire and where it stands right now, and what role attendance might uh, eventually play in this project? Well, I think the Ring of Fire, from uh, a building perspective, is still a little bit out. Uh, I know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Noront, as an example, is you know is definitely looking at moving ahead and, and putting some infrastructure in that will at least give them an opportunity to uh, uh, to get in to get in and do some development as it relates to uh, what the next steps are. The government, you know, definitely has committed some money. Um, you know, there's there's still, I think, a huge. Uh, uh, opportunity to uh, work with First Nations and improve those communities. Um, so I, I personally view the Ring of Fire as being, 
probably five or ten years out from you know a real impact uh, perspective, especially on a place like Timmins. Okay. But I but I do believe that uh, when the Ring of Fire uh, does occur, that uh, Timmins is very well positioned uh, because of the type of uh, suppliers and businesses uh, that we have. I think we've. Uh, you know, uh, we've proven with uh, De Beers and Detour and other projects that, uh, you know, Timmins uh, uh, does have great contractors and, and so they will play a huge part in the building and running of that facility and the maintenance uh, as it moves forward. The other thing that uh, many municipal leaders have worked very hard on was, you know, keeping the Ontario Northland Rail in government hands because I personally believe there's a huge opportunity um, for Ontario Northland, but for uh, you know, to really create a true um, east-west um, run across northern Ontario and, and connect the northwest and the northeast, and you know, I personally believe uh, when you think of why the Ontario Northland Rail was formed uh, back in 1903 to develop the north, that this is just an extension of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I believe the Ring of Fire has the potential to change the economy of. Uh, for sure, Northern Ontario, Ontario, and Canada. So, so in other words, if and when the Ring of Fire project moves forward at full capacity, it may provide the impetus required for the provincial government to invest dollars into the expansion of the Ontario Northland. Absolutely, and you have to look at that. I mean, there's other there's other opportunities. You know, we talk a lot about the Ring of Fire, and it's huge. But I think when you look at other mining opportunities that could thrive with uh, with rail. Um, you know, we need somebody to take that chance to develop that infrastructure, and I think you would see a lot of uh, not ring of fire type mines, but mining and forestry and other uh, uh, base, uh, not not necessarily base metals, but other uh, metals that would utilize Ontario Northland. I think it's a partnership between the the uh, businesses, communities, the province, and the feds. I think that's okay. uh, what it, what's got to happen, and I think uh, you could use. Uh, Northern Quebec as an example, or you could use the uh, the oil sands in Alberta as another example, or what's happening in Saskatchewan, but you need that true partnership to make it happen. There's one final current issue that I'd like to address with you in this interview, and it is the secondary sewage treatment plant. We've reached out to members of the community on social media for topics for this interview, and the one topic that came, came back to us over and over and over uh, was for you to address or provide an update or some sort of clarification on the situation surrounding the secondary sewage treatment plant. Can you take a few moments just to clarify the situation surrounding this the, the plant and, and give us an update uh, so that uh, our viewers know exactly what the situation is with regards to this project? Uh, yeah, so the secondary sewage treatment plant uh, was uh, a project uh, that was going to um, ensure that the city uh, met the regulations for water and sewer uh, as per the Walkerton regulations. Secondary sewage treatment plant was something that was not um, uh, nice to have. It was something that was a must. Uh, So obviously when uh, there was infrastructure money available through stimulus projects to be able to build a secondary sewage treatment plant, uh, the city of Timmins actually had three weeks to submit it. So I think if people think about uh, the submission of just slightly under $60 million and the one-third, one-third uh, partnership mm-hmm. uh, with both the province and the feds. Um, it, it was uh, a good way and a cheaper way for the city to be able to build something that they would have had to build possibly on their own. Uh, I think uh, where the confusion has come in with the public is uh, to build a secondary sewage treatment plant and the $60 million cost was a good number. Uh, but was what was never factored in as part of the project uh, was the tie-in between now the new secondary plant and the existing primary plant. And that's where uh, the extra dollars have been required. Uh, the thinking when we put the, uh, the application in and the discussions that we had with the province at the time was uh, they recognized that we didn't have the time to do the proper engineering, which would have taken 12 or 14 months at that time, and as we were going through the process, they would work with us uh, on those extra costs, uh, you know, realizing that a secondary tr- treatment plant on its own um, would do nothing uh, if it can't work with the primary plant. So that's really where it's at. So the project as it stands right now is an $80 million project. Um, all the numbers that I gave you earlier yep. were without um, HST on them. So when you factor the HST in, I believe it takes the number up closer to $82 million. 
Okay. And again, the province and feds are very, very well aware of of the challenge that we have. And I guess if hindsight uh, being 2020, um, if I had my uh, crystal ball and had to do it again, um, I would have divided it into two projects. The one project would have been the uh, the building of the plant, which the $60 million would have been uh, sufficient to do the building and the engineering of. And then the second portion was uh, would have been the uh, the additions as it relates to the tie-in, and uh, those tie-in numbers would have been separated out and, and gone to the province and the feds uh, in a separate form. Uh, unfortunately, uh, like I said earlier, you know, with the willingness of government at the time of building to work with us, um, as it relates to this project, uh, as they started looking at their financial picture, um, obviously they looked at, at saying, you know, we don't have the extra money to do this right now. Okay. We, the city, have put um, uh, a few different type options in front of them, uh, you know, because this project really isn't completed until 2015. So okay. obviously as long as we had some kind of a guarantee that, you know, extra money would be coming, you know, we don't need that money today. But can we look out at 2015 or 2016? Uh, can we look at a higher rate of funding as it relates to the project in the east end that we have to do? That right now we don't have any government money and a ministry order to do, which is estimated to be about a $16 million project. Um, you know, could there be uh, government money allotted to that to knock the cost down? So we've we put a multitude of different funding options in front of them, and my hope is is that. Uh, one of those options will be chosen. I, I think they recognize the issue, and I think they want to work with the city. Okay. I just think they haven't found out that. I, I don't think they've found that financial mechanism uh, to be able to work with us. Join us tomorrow for the final portion of our interview with Mayor Tom Malagrin, where he'll reminisce about his eight years as mayor, where he shares what one do-over he'd like to have, what he'd like to uh, share as far as advice is concerned with the man who will replace him, and what he's now going to do on his Monday nights. All this and more on part three of our interview with Merrick Tom Logan. Thanks for joining us. My name is Frank Rock, and this is Speaking of Timmons.